Welcome. Wow. First panel of the day, and it's full. Hi, guys. I'm Caitlin McFarland. I'm one of the executive directors. <laughs> Welcome to season six. Um, I vied to intro this one. I am so excited. Uh, two years ago, we closed the festival with the leftovers. It was between season one and season two. We had no idea what was ahead of us. Uh, we are now basically starting the festival. First official panel. Uh, with it again with Damon back, Tom Parada has joined us, and um, Mimi Leader. We cannot wait to talk about the finale. It was four days ago, we're gonna get into it. And so I'd like to introduce your moderator, Mo Ryan. Hello, hello, hi. I'm Mo Ryan, in case you didn't figure that out. Um, so, why are you here? <laughs> but like really, why are you here, man? Um, I'm here, I can just speak for myself, because I enjoy, um, you know, people being immersed in bodies of water. <laughs> I enjoy assassins, local or international. Um, I, I enjoy a good Tasmanian sex boat as much as the, re the next person. I'm a fan of chiseled abs. And um, what's the other thing I wanted to mention here? Um, goats, right? <laughs> give it up for goats. Um, what I would like to do, though, is give it up for the amazing creative team behind The Leftovers. So right now I'm gonna bring, off, bring out to you uh, the executive producer, uh, Damon Lindelof. Executive, um, executive producer and the guy who wrote the book, Tom Parada. And my goddess, my queen, executive producer and amazing director, Mimi Later. Okay, so I brought this. I don't know if anyone can see. Um, it's HBO sent it out before the first season. It's a Tupperware container that says The Leftovers. <laughs> and I, it's still clean, I haven't used it because I wanted to use it to catch my tears. Um, so here, here we go. I don't know, is Parada a crier? Oh, big what, time. Big time, okay. <laughs> the tissue, everyone gets tissues. Mimi's made a sterner stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Well, then the goal is to make Mimi cry. Okay. Um, so it's obvious it's been four days since the finale. I would love you guys to talk about what about the reactions to the phenom finale has surprised you or, or made you, uh, given you some food for thought? Well, um, is this on? Yeah. Well, it's humbled me and it's made me cry a lot. And um, I feel like I'm in mourning when I should be celebrating. Um, so it's cathartic and it's a joy to read everything that's being written, yeah, and especially your writing. Thank you. Uh, you know, the show has been a lot about uh, faith and religion, and I think the finale turned out really to put that into action. The show asked the viewer and, and the characters to, to believe in a story. And, and uh, it, it was almost like in a kind of microcosm we got to witness uh, the way agreement among people could lead to a, a religion. You know, I, mean, I, I don't mean the leftovers of religion, I just mean everybody who believes Nora's story um, just joined a religion. <laughs> Score. And we're uh, gonna get that that party boat going real soon. That's, that's what's happening? Uh, I, I'm just really relieved that no one asked me if they were dead the whole time. <laughs> that's um, because they were in purgatory the whole time. <laughs> no, it's you know it's been a very uh, incredible experience, and we got to watch the finale with a room full of uh, 500 people, which was sort of strange because I think the leftovers is a very intimate experience and. 
you know, we watch it, we invite it into our homes or we watch it on our phones or our iPads, you know, just feet from our face. And it was just very weird to see it projected at, at, at that size and then immediately go and have to talk about it. And then we grabbed, we had some dinner afterwards and by the time my wife and I got home, it was, uh, it was, it was very late, so I didn't get to do the deep dive into the internet um, in terms of like what everybody, and I, I got to just be with the fact that it was over, and then the next, uh, the next day I, I started clicking, and I just don't know what to do, you know, it, it, it's easier to, it's easier to take in, you know, confusion and criticism and hatred than it is to take in love. <laughs> this is the, this is the, na it's just our, our nature, unfortunately we're wired that way, so. I could only take it in drips and drabs, and, uh, but it's been a, a, an incredible experience. Um, I just want to get into, um, actually step into the Wayback Machine a little bit. And I remember being at the um, TCA panel, which is an industry thing, TV Critics Association panel, where after season one you said, we're going to double down on the leftovers. And, and here's a recreation of my facial expression. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Um, I still am, I, I know you went on and, and talked more, but I just, like, what did you mean by that? Because I, th I feel like I maybe vaguely understand what you meant by that, and I was obviously, um, I think that the, the, that the evolution of the show has been amazing, but what, for you, when you said you were doubling down, what did that mean? Um, I have no idea what I, <laughs> what I mean at any given time. I, I think what I meant was that there were a lot of things a lot of things traditionally go on during the first season of, of a show, both behind, uh, in front of the camera and behind the camera, um, uh, that are really relevant. But I think by the time we got to the end of the first season, we started understanding as storytellers um, what the show was going to be. And Mimi, who was not there for the pilot, and her, the first episode that she directed was the fifth episode, and we hired her immediately to be an executive producer on the show. And in many ways, uh, not in many ways, she is a showrunner just as much as, as Tom or, or I are. So but by the end of the season, I was starting to become much less risk averse. And so I think that the idea that in the first season of the Leftovers, you know, things that made me nervous or scared me, um, I was not inclined to accept. And then as we moved into the second season, um, it was just, there was a lot more openness to listening and, uh, and letting the show evolve and, and stop being uh, apologetic about the show. But that, but all of that, all of those sensations, you know, are encapsulated in the idea of doubling down, which is you put down a bet like Matt Jamison does, and you win, and you should w walk away from the table with your winnings. Um, I wasn't sure that it felt like a win at the end of season <laughs> one, but it was sort of like we're just going to stay at this table and we're just going to keep keep pushing our chips over and over and over again until it's over. And that will make for a much more exciting ride. Maybe we leave the casino with nothing, but we're playing with house money at this point. Yeah, but... You, you tell me what I meant. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> as, as you so often do, yeah. thank God. Uh, I, I mean, I think, I think, you know, the show did double down in terms of risk-taking, but it also um, changed course in, in all sorts of ways. You know, we moved from Mapleton uh, to Miracle, and I think we added the Murphys, and I think the tone of the show also changed. So there was a kind of double down, but there was also a kind of, you know, reset, as you know, whatever word you want to use to say. Um, the show intensified, but it also became something new that year. I, th I think I, I also want to say I don't know if it was at that TCA or the TCA before, but I are, but I said that the leftovers was a grower, not a shower. You did say and that. This is this this was before the show had a grand tradition of dick jokes, but you know. But, but that was a foreshadowing. Yeah, I really did believe, you know, that it was going to take some time to figure it out. Um, Mimi, I want to talk to you about, um, you know, I think one of the things many people commented on was. When you did move to Austin and then further out to Australia, the sense that the show worked within the landscapes and within those places really well and incorporated them really well, and yet also there was such, a, literally a tight, a tight focus many times on monologues or on per personal experiences. What was your core feeling about how, how did you re retain the intimacy and yet incorporate the environment, I guess that's my question. Well, I feel the environment, you know, really spoke to us when we came to Austin. 
the landscape was was vast as it was in Australia, and and it was very detailed and it became a character in the show, and uh, I thought the wide shots, the scope against the intimacy, actually brought us closer to the characters, because it allowed us to breathe for a second and then get back in there, and those faces and you know the words that they say were so powerful. You just you, you needed a moment to breathe, and um, so that exploration was, was really fun. And you know, the second season, you know, we opened the show up you know, with more color, which represented a little more hope, um, that we were coming to Miracle, and um, you know, anything but, but it was of great value to have the landscape speak to the show. So, so as, um as one of the showrunners, you know, what, what, when you spoke with directors who were coming to The Leftovers, what would you talk to them about? Like, you know, obviously every script is different, every storyline is going to be different, every actor is going to be different, but when you thought about sort of marching orders, so to speak, for the directors that were working on the show as well, where did you try to kind of put their heads at? Well, you know, um, it always begins with the great scripts from Damon and Tom and their brilliant group of writers. And... Um, you know, we developed a, a, a stable uh, of great directors who, you know... Um, and we kept them in a stable. Yeah, and we kept them That's there. True. They tried they to get were, out. They were, they were well fed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, yeah. And, uh, you know, they, you know, you know, we would do tone meetings, you know, and talk about what the script is about. We'd talk about the new characters, the Murphys, and... You know, when you're a directing showrunner, you know, you talk to them, you've had the experience of working with the actors and, uh, and, um, and this new crew, and you talk to them about, you know, their strengths, you know, where you can take them, um, what their abilities are. Um, and you talk about the material and the new tone. And, you know, we've hired such great artists, you want them to bring something of their own artistry into the piece, and they always do because they're incredible artists. Each and every one of our directors um, put a stamp on this show and made it better and made it beautiful. One of the things for me, certainly, in the whole run of the show, I mean, the cast was amazing. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right about that, right? Am I, am I right? I agree. Yeah. Um, do you, do you see? Did you also see Evie out there? Angelina Murphy. I'm. I see Evie. Is Evie? I. This is very strange. Am I seeing something? She. Am I right about the cast yeah. being great? Yeah, she is. Yes. <laughs> Jasmine <laughs> Savoy Brown, everybody. <laughs> Evie <laughs> Murphy. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so the cast was obviously great, but I want to. If we, I know we have a, cl a few clips, which um, hopefully we'll get to. But I want to just, if we could, put up the clip of Scott Glenn um, in one of his amazing scenes in his Australian outback adventure. Do we have that clip of of him talking about the rain song, uh, Kevin Garvey Senior? I just had a thought. So, Christopher Sunday was, you know. Basically, Kevin Garvey Sr. was, it's, he was trying to collect a series of stories, and that's what your show did, in a, in a way. It was a series of stories joined together um, by people's faith in those stories. Yeah, I, you know, some, sometimes you intend things, and sometimes you discover things, and sometimes it's a little bit of both, and I think that, you know, we, we did make an effort over the course of the series, but particularly in the third season, to kind of make it very explicit that all of the characters on the show were trying to find a unified narrative that they could all be a part of. Um, and, um, and, and, and the idea that Matt Jameson was writing a book that Kevin Sr. believed he wasn't enough of a part of, but then when a page of that book ends up in a, in a stranger's hands, he finds a role for himself in it. But I think that the key that we really wanted to illuminate is, is as Scott brilliantly performs and Mimi directed this episode, um, was this idea, he doesn't say this is gonna happen, he says, I believe on the seventh anniversary. 
And so I think that the idea of sort of unpacking belief um, via storytelling, because there's just stories that you tell, whether they're amusing anecdotes, but they're, hopefully there's, there's a point to them. But I think that this idea of belief was something that we were, were really chasing, which is why in the finale we circled back to that idea and very, you know, some of the last lines of dialogue in the series um, are directly related to belief. Yeah, and you know, I think one of the other things that left over is about is the fine line between delusion and belief. So when Scott Glenn says, I believe that, that this, this flood is coming. Um, he just sounds like a crazy man to us. But if a bunch of people believe that a great flood is coming, then you've got a religion. And we're living in an era in which people saying that subject to interpretation is basically like a fact of hourly life. You I just know? heard it about 50 times on CNN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, uh, <laughs> Frazier save us. <laughs> Um, do not speak his name. Do this. <laughs> not until you midnight. keep saying that, yeah. but you were fine with me talking about Balky for like an hour. It's <laughs> fine. Um, I'm okay. By okay. the way, Alan Sepinwall was very upset that I was not going to force you and or Tom Parada to perform, perform the Dance of Joy. <laughs> and we are now spe not speaking now. The night is young. <laughs> it's okay. I hear, there's, there, I hear there's a trivia contest later. <laughs> there's a little, we'll there's, see. there's stuff happening. Yeah. Mimi, I wanted to get back. I, part of the reason I you know, one of them to show that clip was because you obviously you've talked about in some interviews logistical challenges of, of certain aspects of shooting the show. So when it comes to a very intimate, there's there were so many tremendous monologues <laughs> that I would bet for the actors were really challenging and really kind of scary, but obviously, you know, they were amazingly written and well performed. In a way, is it just as much of a challenge to kind of make that kind of intimate moment as powerful as it can be, as it is to go out in the outback and shoot this massive quest, or talk about that? Well, yeah, it's really, I mean, it again starts with the script, and I, I you know, we had these incredibly uh, great actors who really knew their characters, and I would say it's much harder to shoot these intimate dialogue scenes and, uh, you know, find the center and find, you know, the in-between spaces and, um, it, to me, it's much harder to shoot them than shooting these big landscape shots. And um, um, and working with David Gopal as well was was really quite a challenge. He played Christopher Sunday. Yeah, and you know because he came in and uh, you know and I said so you know you've read the script and he goes no I don't read the script <laughs> and I go really sounds like Tom Parada. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm uh, someone reads me the script. And so it was a very interesting, you know, way to work with someone who actually hadn't read the script but was fed the lines and understood the lines. And Scott Glenn, who came in at, I don't know, 77 years old, spot on with every word having a meaning and, you know, just going to that deep end. And uh, they're the hardest scenes to do, to get right, to hit. The other thing that I'll say about what I think you do brilliantly, Mimi, in those scenes are you think about the person who's delivering the monologue, whether in that case it's Scott Glenn or Lindsay Duncan delivers her, a monologue. We don't really know that character that well, but at the end of the, the, that episode, she has to hold the screen right. for eight minutes. Obviously, Carrie Coon um, g gave a very memorable monologue at the end of the series, but Justin delivered one in the scene right, right before that. Um, so, and, uh, and Brenneman has to, ev everyone has to do it. Eccleston, they all have to do it at some point. But I think that the thing that you, you take for granted is the person who's listening to it. Um, and I think that the idea that if you think about the performance that Justin gives in response to Carrie's uh, monologue at the end of the series, or David in this case, or Scott in the case where Lindsay is talking, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the, that, that performance is almost as important as the person who's delivering the monologue because they're the audience's proxy. The way that they are feeling and responding to the monologue, you know, um, or the story that's being told to them, you know, if you watch what Justin is doing in response to um, to Carrie's story, he's probably doing the same thing that you're feeling. So when she starts, it's surprise and incredulity, and then when she ends, it's you know, it's pure emotion. And I think that it takes an incredibly um, uh, uh, present director to say. It, obviously, the light is shining very, very brightly on this person who's speaking, but I have to shine it just as brightly on the person who's listening. 
Thank you. But And also, I would say directorially, what I really tried to do was mirror those images of all those monologues. It was very important to me that they felt similar, that there was a, you know, um, a visual theme to them, so that when you saw them, it maybe felt familiar. It really did, because I actually made a note of that when in the, the, the framing of how there's a wall of windows, the Lindsay Duncan monologue, and then the Carrie Coon monologue, they were very physically, they looked like they were in a similar setting. So it was like a woman telling this heartbreaking story that you kind of can't believe on some level, but she's so grounded and present and real in what she's saying that you're just completely drawn in. That was, that was really interesting that you did that. <laughs> Um, so Tom Parada, um, this is uh, a question that I hope will set the internet aflame. Are you the George R. R. Martin of, of the leftovers verse in that you have a larger, you had, did you have ideas going out beyond the end of your book that were just in your brain that you shared with the rest of the creative team or was it everyone collaborating together to come up with whatever followed the end, the last page of your book? Uh, you know, the, one of the reasons I wanted to go into long-form TV was that I'd had the experience uh, with my novel, Little Children, w w which Todd Field made a beautiful movie of. But we also lost um, big chunks, chunks of our script just because of time constraints. Right. And at the same time, I was watching these TV shows and seeing how accommodating they were, how deep they could go in exploring characters over time. And, and I thought The Leftovers... I really did think I had done it as a microcosm. I'd taken this global event and told it through one family in one town. Um, and it was just clear to me that there was a lot more, uh, there are many more facets to this story than I had put in the book. But I didn't, you know, I'd finished the book and I thought, Let, let's try and make it a TV show. But I did not go in with an agenda, you know, and where the story went, um, you know, was so much beyond what I could have imagined or, or done on my own. I've started to have this feeling that the book was like an egg corn, and now we've got this mighty oak tree that is, you know, uh, the TV show, because it really did just grow so far beyond um, where I started, and I have to give, you know, huge credit to Damon. I think, uh, you know, he, many of the changes and, you know, just swerves and, and um, brilliant moves came from, you know, the vision that, that he had, which um, I think, you know, transformed the material while staying true to its original concerns, which is a, just a really, um, been a great experience for me as a writer. I feel like, um, you know, it's still my story in some sense, but it's so much more. That said, he was always pitching dragons. <laughs> <laughs> always. We never I knew it. To it. Yeah. It was supposed to be a dragon boat. Yeah. Did you know that? Trivia. That's a true story. It's supposed to be dragons. Um, would you ever return to it? To, to the leftovers? To the to leftovers verse, as I call it. <laughs> I'm trying to make that happen. Work you, with me. You mean as a, as a fiction writer? In any, in any context. Uh, I, no. No? <laughs> You're done? The book is closed. The book of Kevin, the book of Nora, they're all finito. So you're moving on. We can break this now to a Perfect Strangers reboot. This, time, <laughs> this team... It's, it's happening. I'm kidding. Do not print that in your stories in Variety. Um, um, yeah, I actually want to talk much more about the sex boat. Um, that was you, right? Like, I, th one of my big, like, in my list of questions for today, the first on the sheet was always, who came up with the Tasmanian sex boat? And it sounds like from different stories I've read, you just Googled, Sex lion or something? I don't know. What happened? I, what happened to you? Who hurt you, Damon? <laughs> I've got a list as long as Arya Stark's. Um, the, uh, I, I, I always feel a little bit uncomfortable answering the question whose idea was because um, our writer's room was incredible and I, I feel like it's, it, it, it's worth mentioning all of their names. Um, Patrick Somerville, Haley Harris, uh, Tom Speziali, another executive producer on the show, of course, Tom, uh, Nick Hughes, uh, Carly Rae, um, Leela Bayak, and Tom Ricarder um, were the season three writers. And I think that when, 
basically this idea of like, oh, you had, you were the one who said this, but it's actually a byproduct of throwing the ball back and forth, and it's like, it's a little bit equivalent to you just dunked it, but there were three people who passed it to you, and one guy who's, uh, who set the pick, and and um, and and the and the coach who basically designed the play. So, you know, I, the whole Fraser idea basically came from the idea that we knew that we wanted to do Job. We knew that we wanted Matt Jameson to confront a version of God who was an Old Testament God and therefore a dick. Um, and um, but wearing a red baseball cap. Yes. We thought Weird. Trump was going to lose, man, <laughs> when we wrote that. In any case, uh, um, that's what we were building towards. And we also felt like the, the environment in which he confronts God should feel biblical. And what's more biblical than lots of people having sex all the time? Because um, every, every time in the Bible... I went to Catholic school, and it was yeah. not like that at right. all. But you wanted to be having sex all the time. And every time people are having sex, God gets angry about it. And so... We, and so we were like, we know that there's going to be a confrontation with God. We know that there's going to be lots of sex. And then, the, and then it was like, once Matt has this confrontation with God, we want to kill God. You know, that basically says everything that The Leftovers wants to, wants to say about it, which is we shouldn't put a lot of stock in this guy who basically either healed Matt or didn't heal Matt. Or, but it's going to basically provide Matt Jameson with the ability to kind of walk away from his fixation with this mythic figure and start to focus on the figures in his life. And, um, and so the question that we would put to the writer's room is how do we want to kill God? And so everybody goes around and pitches and we... we Which we, is also what they're trying to figure out on NCIS. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> NCIS. Not many people again. know that. But, uh, <laughs> and so we were, and we also know that we knew that we wanted it to feel vaguely comedic, you know, like kind of Chaplin-esque or like Harold Lloyd and like what are funny ways to kill God? And everybody was pitching, that was a fun day in the room. Everybody was, was pitching a variety of ideas and then I can't remember who it was. I, I, I think it was Nick, you know, who was basically like, he gets eaten by a lion. Um, and we all love that idea. And then, and then the homework that night was, what is a lion doing on this boat where all these people are having sex? And so everybody, you know, I like to go last when we go around the table because if, I'm always hoping that th just a great idea will come up and I won't have to talk. <laughs> and everybody sort of pitched different permutations of, it's a circus, you know, it's a magician's convention, you know, they like to fuck. Um, <laughs> and, um, I do not know yeah, that. It's true. That's uh, I think that's David Blaine's new special on ABC this year. <laughs> David Blaine, I like to fuck. <laughs> and, um, and and so and, we're just working blue today. That's what's happening. I had, I had Googled just the words sex lion, and you know and, I don't want to know anything yeah, that you got. This is why you always erase your browser history. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Um, and this movie, Frasier the Sensuous Lion, popped up, and this, you know, this is like, the, the, there was a movie poster for it, and I was like, what's that? And I clicked on it, and it, it turned out to be based on a true story. That's The Leftovers, based on a true story. Um, and so the story that Lori basically tells actually happened. You know, they took an aging lion from Tijuana, and they brought him to... Um, uh, uh, a wild animal park in Southern California where all the lionesses refused to mate and within like 36 hours, Frasier had impregnated all of them and they made a movie about this. And, and then Frasier of, did this. Yeah, yeah, exactly, he dropped something. But, uh, but as, I, as I was talking, everybody in the room started laughing and, and we just followed our laughter, you know? I mean, I think we're, obviously The Leftovers is, is a pretty far thing from from comedic, but I think that the idea that if it delighted us as a writer's room, we started, you know, that's how the Mark Lynn Baker thing happened. That's, that's how the Wu-Tang trampoline happened. You know, um, it's, it's, it's like these things are both delightful, but also emotionally authentic and honest. And so uh, we, we basically, we chased Frazier. And, you know, one of my favorite lines in that episode, which I'm, I, I know for a fact that I didn't come up with, I think it was Leela, which is after Lori Garvey tells the, st the true story of Frazier and, that, and now that ev they were bringing this descendant of Frazier around to various zoo zoos to impregnate and keep the Frazier line afloat, you know, Matt says, like, oh, that, that's the basis for any religion. But he has blinders on. He can't real. He, but he's like, but I'm still a Christian. And so I just feel like the attacking of other, other people's faiths and then the appropriation of other people's faiths and to, to take Frazier and make him into sort of a mythic god killer was just too delightful for us not, not to do. I think we have a clip of uh, 
God and Matt having a little Matt chat. God is very tricksy. The great Nicole. This is, that's based on an actual conversation between Parada and I. <laughs> Nicole Cassell directed. Nicole, she did an amazing job. And that she had whole this, thing. She had this book uh, on set uh, with about 24 different sex positions. And uh, she uh, would, her and the AD would go uh, up to the extras and go, can you do this one? 17. <laughs> yeah, number four. 14. <laughs> That's happening was, later at the FX party. Um, I'm kidding. I didn't get invited to that party. <laughs> yeah, Damn I know. FX. <laughs> um, I, I would love to talk about, you know, I, I do think it was one of the most the, the directing, the acting, just superlative throughout. But I, I want to ask each of you, what was a choice that, um, it could be Mimi or another director, but what was a choice that a director or actor made, and Mimi, I would love to get your input too, that really kind of broke something open for you or changed how you viewed something or just surprised you in a, in a way, like you were just like blown away. Like that this was some kind of new insight or an, a new way to view the show or the character. Like what, what was a choice that you really loved that kind of broke something open for you? A, a directorial choice or, or an acting choice? Or a choice performance or? choice. Uh, man, there are so many. I mean, one of the things, uh, I think that there are writers, uh, producers who, who love to be on set and they want to you know, choose the costuming and, and figure things out. I love, I, I don't hate being on set, but my favorite part of the process is that we spend a lot of the time generating these pieces of material and then we have these things called tone meetings where we talk about for, first with Mimi and then with the episodic director. Um, let's go through the script and if you, as opposed to saying here's what I want you to do, the director, I basically say do you have any questions about this? Because we have, we've had our chance, here's our testimony, read it over, you know, and interpret it and then we'll see what we get back. And if there's confusion or whatever, we talk about that stuff. And then I don't get it back until it's in the editing room. I don't like to watch dailies or anything. And by then, it has been transformed into this other thing um, that is wonderful, and I get to sh shape it again, but now it, it's a much more or organic uh, being. And I, and I think that there are, there are too many instances in the show to mention. I think one case, is, is the first episode that Craig Zobel directed, episode six of season two, which is called Lens. There's a scene between Carrie Coon and Regina King that we shot here in Austin, which Tom and I wrote that Epic. script. And you know, we wrote that script and we were like, okay, you know, they're saying the things that we need, need them to be saying. And I think that we've earned, and now we understand why Nora threw a rock through, uh, through Erica's window, beca because Erica represents you know, something that she's angry about. Evie disappeared, but Nora doesn't believe that she went to the same place that Nora's kids did, and instead of hugging this woman who's clearly in pain, they're, they're in an antagonistic conversation, and Erica's saying, here's what I believe, and Nora is calling it pathetic. Um, you know, so we talked about all these things, but when we sat in the editing room for the first time and watched that scene, and Craig made a choice that he didn't tell, maybe he told you about, he didn't, he used close-up close-ups like that the show had never done before um, and uh, in terms of getting in on, on Regina and Carrie's faces. And I was just so profoundly affected that I stopped hearing the words and started feeling the feelings. And I think that, you know, and everybody acknowledged, everyone understood that that language was unique to that moment. And it would have been very easy to say, close up, close ups work well for the leftovers. Let's just go back to that well over and over again. And we never did again. Um, uh, to that level, and I think that was a very specific instance of of something, you know, surprising us, and you know, knocked my socks off. I haven't worn socks since. <laughs> I think the close up in Dan Sackheim's episode, when the rain, when the sprinklers go off, and and they're on her face, and the finding of that moment, of the tears, the endless tears, and that's the fourth episode of of season three yeah. after Nora and Kevin have their fight. And you know, I, I know that Dan in, had a close up in mind, but I don't think anyone knew how powerful that close up would be until it presented itself. And that's what's the magic of making movies, movies, television, whatever, is uh, images and ideas present themselves on set. And you've gotta be there. You gotta be present and ready to just see that, let's do it, let's go. And that's the beauty. And I think, um, I, I'll go all the way back 
to season one, and I know, um, you know, a lot of people grumbled about the guilty remnant because they didn't like, you know, watching characters scribble out their dialogue and and hold it up. But I think, um, yes. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think we had no idea um, the power that Anne Dow, Anne Dowd was going to have um, in that role. It was not written to be a. Yeah. Anne Dowd. Yeah. Um, it, you know, wasn't written to be. I think the role that that it became, but she had such force, and she seemed to embody the guilty remnant. As did Marceline Hugo, who played. Gladys, um, you know, Laurie played it in a different way. Laurie was much more ambivalent, um, but but there was power in in those actors, and I think um, it it really put a stamp on the show. And someone else, and I'm not just saying this because she's here, but Jasmine, you know, she had to play Gr Stealth, um, and so when we're first introduced to this character, she's you know she's pitching softballs at her dad, but she's already she's already in the Gr, and I think that that only comes across through performance, that idea of I have broken off from my emotional connections, which was, you know, that was the antagonist of Tom's book and that was the antagonist of the series as personified by the GR is this idea of it hurts too much to, to feel connected to other people. So I'm just breaking off from that. And, um, and I, I think that's a very dangerous, damaging uh, emotional idea. I told Tom when I first met him that my recurring nightmare when I was a kid, and when I share this with people, they nod because they they've had similar nightmares. Is that your parents don't recognize you, you know, um, that they don't uh, care about you anymore. And I think that idea, of some, and as you get older, maybe that's your uh, your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, whoever you love. Um, and once you have kids, maybe it's your kid. But that idea of someone who you care so deeply about suddenly just breaking off that connection, I couldn't imagine that. A, you know, like a worse, a worse feeling, and the GR. That's what they stand for. That's that's why they exist. And that's what we saw, so chillingly in the season two finale. Um, it wasn't the parent not recognizing the child. It was the child. It was uh, Evie not acknowledging Erica in that in that moment. Um, just one of the, you know, one of those chilling moments ever on the on the show. Really scary. Excellent work, Jasmine. <laughs> One of the biggest evolutions of The Leftovers for sure is because I can remember, you know, getting the early episodes from HBO and um, obviously Carrie Coon was in the cast, but she, you know, Nora became an enormous part of the story to the point where, again, I think all the stories of the, of the core characters that we knew were important. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I think that the importance of Nora's and, and how that grew throughout the three seasons was that partly leaning into oh my God, Carrie Coon is one of the finest actors on the face of the planet. Oh, and, and um, or was it partly that Nora, you know, her losses, the show was about loss and disconnection from that which you cared about or needed. And so her losses were so epic that, you know, was it partly her journey represented what, you know, a core thing of what the show was about? Or was it both of those things or other things I'm not talking about? I think both of those things and other things. I mean, we, we loved the idea at, at the time. I think, like, what a, what a Sunday night HBO drama looks like is a, a male anti-hero who's... Orgies. You know, yeah, and orgies, <laughs> who's basically kind of like, you know, who's struggling. And, uh, you know, The Sopranos is one of my favorite shows of all time. But... Um, uh, and, and obviously Breaking Bad and Mad Men. And one of the things that we talked about was sort of this idea of like, how do we diffuse the male antihero trope? And how do we make Kevin Definitely have a dick measuring yeah, thing right. in your show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, how do, how do, That's job one. How do we make Kevin not that? And the, and the answer actually became, what if this show is just as much about Nora, if not more about Nora than it is about Kevin? Um, that he's in service of her story. And in Tom's book, which moved me to tears, and I'm an easy cry, but you know, the, the last sentence of Tom's book, The Leftovers, is Nora Durst has just written a letter to Kevin saying, I'm leaving Mapleton. I think I may have loved you, Kevin, but I, I, can't, you know, I can't accept that love. I don't deserve that love. I'm leaving. She shows up at his house to drop off this letter. There's a baby on the porch that's been left by 
by a Kevin's son. She doesn't know who or, or where it com comes from. She picks it up. Kevin arrives home, and she says, look what I found. And that's the ending of Tom's book. That, to me, was a very strong indication. You give the last line to the lead, you know? And that, again, uh, you know, Justin, I think, would be sitting next to me on this couch nodding alongside me because, you know, for all the things that you said, but in, in many ways, the journey of the show, the most profound loss felt, you know, the person who was struggling most with a variety of coping mechanisms, who was least likely to adopt a system of belief that she deigned to be bullshit, um, you know, it's Nora Durst. And then once Carrie basically, I think from the moment that she auditioned, you know, that was the, you know, we, we, were, we were full in. The only question mark then, then was would she have chemistry with Justin? And uh, I think they had a little, a little bit. <laughs> So didn't work out and no, let me was... let me say you know that it, the book Nora is kind of locked into her grief and her life is a series of rituals to keep to keep remembering her kids but to have a little distance on that memory to just get through the day and I think one of the things that um, Damon brought up very early in the process um, was we need to get Nora out into the world and um, there was a Department of the Sudden Departure in the book, but it was a distant bureaucracy. Nora didn't work for it. And when we, I think it was just a huge thing to move Nora into this job, get her in contact with people who were in her same position, uh, and, and also bring out this idea that, that she is the skeptic. And I think this is one of the things that the show, and, and you know, uh, following Damon's lead, really did was take a book that was very internal and about the you know, introspective experience of, of grief and figure out ways to externalize those things and turn them into, into dramas. And um, to me, that's the, the thing that the show um, has done that I don't know that very many other shows have done, which is to take this, these sort of internal emotional dilemmas and find um, very uh, accessible, dramatic ways to show them, but you have, feel like you haven't seen that drama before. Intensify, I mean, in Tom's book, Nora obsessively watches SpongeBob SquarePants because that was her kid's favorite show, and she catalogs and does recaps of each episode in the show. She so Nora's a TV critic. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it, you know, in the TV show, she hires prostitutes to shoot her in the chest. So there's a, there's a straight line between who those, has not done those that. Those two I emotional mean, ideas, you know, when in Rome. Uh, but I think you know, it's a credit to to all of your work, to, to Mimi's direction, to the other directors, to the performers, to your writing, the writing staff. I mean, watching a lot of TV, you're used to your emotions being manipulated. And there's some times where I'm like, I'm about to cry, but I'm like, this isn't a, this is not a dishonest cry. Like, I know the tricks that you're doing to make me do this. And I think that that's one of the things I really appreciate about, about The Leftovers is that it was not manipulative. I mean, I think there was a real desire at all times to react, to, to, to make these people so fully formed that they weren't necessarily, you know, just aspirational figures. They were real, they were ragged, and the honesty that kind of coursed through it um, was very admirable. I, I have to tell you a story about this, and um, so my, my wife Heidi, who is married to me, and she has to deal with that, um, <laughs> Uh, is also a f uh, is also a fan of of the leftovers, and we've had a very complicated relationship in terms of talking about the show and how she experiences the show. And um, you know, it's obviously deeply personal to me. And but I'll say, like, we had a really hard day in the writers' room. Here's what what we were talk discussing, and she'll be like, "No spoilers," and I'll be <laughs> like, "You know, I have to be able." To, I'm I, with Heidi. Yeah, I have to be able to talk to you about this stuff. But you know, we've gravitated basically. <laughs> You know, I think what's like best for our marriage is that the leftovers is be I can talk about my emotional journey without talking about plot. And so she experiences the show pretty much in the same way that the audience does. Maybe it, she'll watch it on DVD like a couple days earlier than it airs, but she, you know, so that when her friends say, oh, this, epi you know, this is how I felt during this episode, she doesn't feel like she just experienced it at the same time. She wants a little bit of time with it. So she, she's been sit she was sitting on the finale watching the finale you know, all the way up until basically the week before it aired, and then she finally watched it. And um, we didn't quite know how to talk about it between the two of us. And then she's, uh, and then we, we, we sent it out to, uh, like, on the Tuesday before the finale to the critics so that they would have time with it if they wanted to process it. And then we had a screening in New York on that Thursday night. 
And so Heidi was obviously like, how are people responding to the finale? And I said, I'm getting you know, really nice emails and texts that people are having a profound emotional rela uh, relationship with it in some cases. And someone had texted me that they, you know, that they cried so hard it gave them a headache. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, she, and Heidi was like, well, I didn't cry. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Like, we, you know, we all go on our own journey. And she's like, well, it doesn't mean that I didn't like it. I just can't be expected to cry. And I was like, okay. <laughs> That's cool. Like, you know, we'll revisit this at, at, at another time. So, so. The, I want a show about your marriage. So, on Saturday morning, you know, normally our son wakes us up at like 6 a.m. and we're, you know, we're running around the house or whatever. I'm, I, I sleep in until like 7.30 on Saturday morning. I come downstairs and my son is, you know, playing Minecraft or something. And I'm like, where's mom? And he says she's in her office. And I go into Heidi's office and she's, bawling, she's sobbing. And I said, what happened? And she said, I'm reading Maureen Ryan's piece. <laughs> this is true. And I wanna say that one of the things that I'm proudest about, about the show, and I wanted to say to, this to you in front of a lot of people because it would get uncomfortable if, they weren't, if there weren't a lot of people, <laughs> is that, you know, is that it's created this space for people to talk about this really, uh, really uncomfortable stuff as it relates to loss and belief and and systems of faith, et cetera, and for them to show us who they are. Um, and I also want to commend, you know, your publication variety for, you know, it's not just a blog post. It's it's sort of saying there's a new there's a new way of approaching these things critically, which is your job is simply to assess whether something is good or bad, um, but it should be what does this mean to me and hopefully you've moved that needle. And what I was really r amazing about your piece, other than the poetry within, was that so many of your peers could have said, you crossed a line, Mo. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to emote on this level. You're not allowed to reveal uh, personal aspects of your personality. And for people in this room who have not read what Mo wrote about the qu quantum physics and loss as it relates to the leftovers, it's, it's more, about the experience of being human than it is about the show, but it uses the show as the, as the texture for that, so I'm allowed to compliment you. But all of your peers were like, this is an incredible piece of writing. And so we were all so excited that you were moderating this panel because you know, you're writing the show now too. Uh, and when you asked Tom, is there gonna be any more leftovers? I think we're done writing it, but Y you guys can feel free to write whatever you want. It's, it's yours now as much as it is ours. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I want to point out my husband in the audience and my boss in the audience, and they're both like... They, they're two different people? They, <laughs> it's surprised surprise. They say that. Yeah. Huh. But have you ever seen them in the room together? Aside from now right I now. Can. Yes, they're stuck. Um, so they both talk me down off various ledges many times, and they both are just incredibly supportive of, of my um, crying a lot. And so thank, thanks to, thank you for, for giving me the chance to write that, honestly. I mean, your show and your performers. I'm touched by it. Um, I wrote that before I saw the finale, and, um, and then I just, just like watched the finale, and I'm like, well, this is awkward, because, uh, Terrible finale, right? No, I'm kidding. Um, the, the finale was, I thought it was so, I, I just think, I, I want you guys to talk a little bit about the finale. I know it's maybe bringing us full circle, that it was so stripped back in a way. It was like the show had taken us on all these great rides and all these wild swings and, and all these incredible chances that, that the assassin realm and this, the party boat with the sex line and all the stuff. like. All of which I loved, but I think, was it really a conscious thing for all of you to kind of come back to something very simple, not simplistic, but simple? I mean, one of my favorite sayings as a critic is that complication is not complexity. And I think that that was an incredibly complex finale, and yet the elements of it. Ma Mimi, what were you going to say? I was going to say when I received the script, I was stunned, and I was humbled and I was, uh, it was, it was a poem. And I, my mantra during that entire shoot was, 
keep it simple, keep it simple, <laughs> don't complicate it. But I just, you know, every time I had the urge to do something big, it was like, no, keep it simple. And, and that said, though, I had to respect the piece. That said, I, I think it does feel epic, you know, I mean, I think that you didn't open it up and there are, you know, Nora riding her bike or, you know, if you basically say like on the page, on the page, Nora climbs a hill and frees a goat that's stuck in a fence, you know, <laughs> that's what it is. And it becomes this other thing because of you and because of Carrie and the goat. He was okay, but you know. But I, Action but I mean, goat. like you, you transform it. And I'll talk a little bit about the end of the world, and then I think Tom should talk about Kevin and Nora, which is um, uh, very apropos. But we had a problem, at, at least we perceived it to be a problem, which is that the third season, you know, when HBO basically started doing the promos and the first episode of the third season, which is always like a pilot in a way, because it's saying this is. There's a continuing arc here, but here's the new idea. And the new idea is like, the world is going to end, probably. If, if the world doesn't end, something even better than the, something even bigger than the end of the world is going to happen. Um, and, and there's a countdown to this day, and it's creating this emotional energy in all the characters. And we knew that it was not gonna happen. Um, we we're on, on the record as calling this Chekhov's apocalypse. Um, <laughs> You know, there's a rule called Chekhov's gun, which is if you show a gun, you have to shoot somebody with it. This was the apocalypse that wasn't going to happen. And so the first thing that we did was we decided to open the season with giving the audience, this is what it looks like when the apocalypse doesn't happen. And so we're interested in exploring the emotional frequency of, you know, why do people keep going up on the rooftop? How many times do you have to go up on the roof before you realize nothing's gonna happen? And Mimi directed that episode as well and in incredibly beautifully. So we're like, we're gonna, get, we're, we're gonna signal to you what, that nothing's gonna happen. But then once nothing does happen, as an audience, are you, do you emotionally disconnect? Do you not care anymore? Um, are you sort of like, now the, now the final episode feels like it's an epilogue. So how do we do the end of the world and make it feel like it not happening was a revelation for the characters? But then how do we create the space for the final episode to be now what? you know, which is the question that, uh, that Senior asked Junior um, on the end. And it is, I think, overly reductive and a little bit offensive to say, now love, you know, now it's just all about love. Because love is, uh, is much more complicated than that. Um, and so the, the effort to basically break a final episode that was about showing how complex love can be because very often we don't feel like we deserve love. Um, uh, it's hard to connect with people. Uh, and be vulnerable and show them your true selves, but that kind of, that, those were the beginning of the conversations and then the decision was made to just say, let's tell this, th this story through Kevin and Nora. Yeah, I mean, I think the, for all of uh, the epic and cosmic elements of the leftovers, the essential uh, questions we've always asked is, could this family stay together, you know, in season one? Can the, can the Garvey stay together? You know, the Garveys fall apart, but at the very end, um, something is restored. Um, this baby is found. Nora decides to stay. Oh, so now we have this new family. Season two is, can this new family stay together? Um, and we watch that new family barely hang on, but when we see them in season three now, something's happened. You know, uh, Lily's gone. Uh, there are new fractures between uh, Kevin and Nora. Nora's starting to think about her kids again. It's something she's kept at bay uh, for, for the whole show. And, and um, you know, I think we stayed true to, uh, you know, the core of the show, which really is a question about people and relationships. And, and uh, you know, I don't think we ever say happily ever after in the show, but we say in this world that's marked by loss, where characters are reeling from, you know, uh, myriad losses, um, can we just leave them in a moment of restoration, consolation, um, you know, a successful journey to reconnect. Because, you know, it's just, it really has always been about connection and that felt right for us to end on just the, the you know, the most basic form of connection. I think there, there's this thing that people say that to me is both incredibly romantic and terribly sad, which is when people are together for a long time, you know, man and woman, woman and woman, man and man, whatever it is, but they love each other. Um, they say, I hope I, I go first. 
I hope I die first because I, I couldn't deal with the pain of, of losing you. And whenever I hear that, my writer's brain goes like, well, you're fucking selfish, you know, <laughs> because you, know, you should basically be like, I hope you go first because that will spare you the pain you know, of having to lose the awesomeness that is me. Um, but, you know, this, this paradigm is fascinating to explore as a writer because you are investing in a stock that is going to crater. You know, that is love. Um, it's going to end unless you both jump off the cliff at the same time, not advocating that. Um, uh, unless you Romeo and Juliet it, which is why that's the pervasive romantic story of our, of our age, and it was written you know, 500, 600 years ago now, but it's like, that's the way you do love. You go both at the same time. That's just not the way that it works. They weren't really planning that, though. Right, what's that? <laughs> they weren't really planning that. That's correct, yes. There, there, there were hijinks ensued, that's true. <laughs> Shakespeare, that was not the original yeah, ending. Like, oh. Yeah, I can f do we have any time for audience questions? I realize now that that was part of the, there's part of the deal with, this is my first panel, so be kind. Um, do, we, do we have time for that? Or how, I don't know actually how that works. Do I just, do we do a Phil Donahue style thing and I walk into the audience? I think, the, ma I think the man on the pillar with the, uh, with the, uh, with the, with the uh, hat on his knee should probably ask a question. S uh um, hello, everyone, and thank you. And I'm not going to ask a question about this color. I just I wanted to ask uh, with two things. I thought Nora putting her cigarette away at the end of last scene was one of the most powerful tiny, tiny moments in, in the whole series. But I also just wanted to ask you about I Believe You. Uh, it, it's just, you know, that kind of further into that microcosm of that last scene, the writer and the director, and there you are. but. It's just so powerful. Um, I think Mimi should probably talk about the moment of, of directing that and what it was like on the set. Tom and I were, uh, it was, we were there and it was an incredibly important moment. But th to the cigarette, I read a, uh, uh, Jeff Jensen wrote a, a piece about the show for Entertainment Weekly and he, he said, Nora is a guilty remnant. He didn't capitalize the G and the R, but it was like, I said to Tom, oh, this is the first time I understand like what the GR really is. And when you actually see what Nora is doing in isolation, she's not speaking, she's smoking, you know, she's not putting on the white. I did notice that she wore a white sweater at right. the end. But yeah. she, is, she is functioning and she's cut herself off from feeling. So the, her decision to stop smoking, I think was her basically saying, I'm ready to come out of the guilty remnant also um, smoking results in emphysema and low fetal birth weight, so <laughs> don't, don't do it. Um, but then I think Mimi should talk about the I Believe moment because uh, um, she directed it. Well, you know, it, it was a very, you know, it was the, 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 the most important moment in the whole series for, for all of us because um, I think we're all have these belief systems and I think Kevin's answer to her story that he believes is is very relevant to the questions we all ask ourselves and um, whether it was important for him to believe whether it was true or not um, it doesn't really matter if it was true or not all that mattered was that he believed her and with that moment, they could truly connect, and they did. And it was a hard moment, but it was a very simple moment. But it was, you know, beautifully done by, by Justin. And it was, I mean, it was, it's hard to talk about the moment because <laughs> it, it was, you know, we didn't do many takes on it. Well, we did several. <laughs> Now that I think of it, we did, and you know, it just we just it just had to la it, the the landing of it had to be full of truth and authenticity, and I believe it did, and it I I think that's the big question we're all as we're all asking, you know, ourselves. Well, it's, it's interesting too because he doesn't just say I believe you. He said, Why wouldn't I believe you? Um, you're here, and what what he means I think is that um, any story that allows her to come out of her isolation and, and be with him is all right with him. Um, it, the story works is really what he's saying. I believe it because it works. 
it gets me what I need and, and it gets you where I need you to be. Um, so it's not so much a matter of truth as just pragmatics. Is a question? So I see a hand back there. Hi, hand guy. Go ahead. Yeah. Australia is not often represented in American television or film, but uh, Damon now twice has represented Australia, like in the past and with the leftovers. I was curious as to why you chose Australia as a setting. And then secondly, um, how you were able to deal um, so effectively with the very complicated um, representations of indigenous culture in Australia and the cultural appropriation, which is a very important cultural issue for Australia. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, for Australia, um, it's always been a, a very magical place for me in terms of, you know. Well, you the, like islands. Yeah, it is, it is one. But there, there's something that's been kind of fascinating about it. But ultimately, I think that the very short answer, and I could go on ad nauseum, because there was a lot of Australian cinema that really inspired the leftovers. <laughs> Peter Weir films that we've mentioned, Wake and Fright. Uh, was another one, the George Miller's uh, Mad Max films. But it just feels so far. And I think that when you are telling a story, uh, people, it always frustrates me, and I've said this myself, and when, when I say it, it frustrates me as it's coming out of my mouth, is it's about the journey, not the destination. But you do want to get a sense of having gone very far, both physically and emotionally, and that's why Sydney to Los Angeles, or Jarden to, you know, to Melbourne and to the Outback. As for the indigenous culture, um, this was something that we didn't really understand ourselves as writers, but became fascinated by, and it was really important for us to get right. And I think my introduction to the indigenous culture was through the, through the cinema, through the last wave of uh, a Peter Weir film. But I think that this idea, we started, call, you know, just the fact that we were calling them Aborigines, we didn't realize that that's not something you should be saying. Um, uh, and Mimi, and particularly Tom Speziali, um, uh, and another, uh, our other executive producer, Gene Kelly, whose name should be sung to the, to the heavens of rain creation, um, uh, went down and spent a lot of time with the indigenous peoples of uh, Australia to make sure that they were, treating, they were being treated with a high degree of respect and that you know, we named this third episode Crazy White Fella Thinking, which is something that our, um, that our indigenous peoples uh, um, sort of uh, expert consultant said uh, in response to one of our scripts, uh, this is crazy white fellow thinking, and we're like, oh, that's going to be the tonality of the show, which is we're trying to appropriate their story and take it as our own, and they're, and they're rejecting it with grace. You know, um, That was the tone that we were basically trying to chase. Um, if we, I, I'll take some more questions unless what's... what's Oh, so three to four, four hours. <laughs> Last question. All right, so we'll take this young lady's question. Is you don't no pressure okay. on that. The music um, really added like another aspect to the storyline that was so like moving to that too, and like sobbing listening to it. I have dreams to remember, and like realizing that they do have dreams to remember. And so, what part of the making of it was the music added? I mean, was that? Sometimes we know in the writer's room as we're first coming up with something, like in the case of AHA, you know, um, we knew that as we were writing the script because we needed the physicist to be playing the name that tune and there's something about that song that, you know, we wanted to appropriate. So it's like, here's an 80s pop song, but is there a way that every time anybody who watches The Leftovers, every time they hear Take On Me, they'll think of The Leftovers, let's appropriate it and, and add a new context to it. And because of that video, it was always about people being interdimensionally separated, uh, love story-wise, which felt very much on, on point. So in that case, we knew. But then most of the time, it's a discovery that we make in the editing room. Um, in the case of the finale, here's a fun fact. Um, we, we, uh, uh, Tom had pitched, and we loved uh, We Got Tonight by Bob Seger. And then they used it to play. That's, so that's what actually Justin and Carrie danced to in the finale, but then fucking Mr. Robot again, you know, they used that exact song the night after we shot it for their season finale. 
Which this had already happened with Where Is My Mind in season two. Sam Esmail has really got a problem with He's you, Damon. He's one step <laughs> ahead of the game. And we, we love Mr. Robot and we love <laughs> Sam's work, but it was sort of like, we can't do it now. Thanks a lot. And then, so it was, uh, and so we replaced the song editorially with Dolly Parton's original version of I Will Always Love You. Um, the Whitney Houston version is a cover. And so that's what Mimi cut it, and, and her director's cut cut it too. And then that felt, you know, too on the nose, um, even though the song is incredible and beautiful. So we started experimenting around and we found the Otis Redding, which felt like it was a call back to, you know, Otis Redding that we had used earlier through the show and it just clicked and, and so we went with it there. So it's a very organic uh, process. Well, the other thing about the Otis Redding is that it, it's uh, not just a sweet love song, right? It has that dissonant part. When right. it goes, bad, sweet dreams, bad dreams. And, right. and it's really, uh, kind of gets at what's what's happening inside of Nora at that moment. Yeah, all the music in the finale, the Billy Holiday and the Otis Redding, when you unpack the lives of the artists who sang those songs, they're very complex humans who sing love songs with a lot of cynicism. Um, and I think that that's, Nora wants to sing love songs, but she does so with a lot of cynicism. And I can't answer the music question without giving a tremendous amount of um, uh, accolades to Max Richter, who both composes the score, but then Liza Richardson, who curates all of the all of the needle drops. So, so I'm going to take moderator's prerogative here and ask one last question. I'm sorry if anyone at HBO is mad at me, but one last question. What are they going to do? Fire us? <laughs> Show's done. Point Lindelof. <laughs> um, so um, obviously we've talked about in many interviews about how HBO very graciously said, hey, come back and make a third season. I'm so glad that happened because I was able to cry much more extensively. Um, but what if HBO had come back to you and said, we want two more seasons? I actually, I mean, as much as I love the show, I think that there's a certain power and it's about extremity and there's only so long that you can take Mind that, mind that kind of emotional and psychological and even physical extremity. I mean, I th do you think three was the right number? Would, if they had said two more, Damon, would you have been like, okay? That is an impossible question to answer because it's based on a hypothetical, on a past version of me. Are you going to talk about it at the closed hearing? Yeah, <laughs> and that's good. Here's what I'll say is, if they had said we want two more seasons, I would have... I would have battled very aggressively to change their mind about that. Because um, it felt so, it was so clear to us that we were closer to the end than we were to the beginning, that we weren't at a midpoint. So end of season two, if there's two more seasons, you're at a midpoint. It felt like we were coming to the end. But if they had said, it's two seasons or nothing, you know, like so e either the show ends here at the end of season two, or we need you to make two more, we probably would have made two more. You know, that, 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 that's my guess. But that's the good news about HBO is that's, that they don't roll that way. I mean, um, and I think a lot more television is basically like, hey, maybe it's a couple years between episodes of Fargo or, you know. Louis um, C.K. show might come yeah, back. Yeah, Louis C.K. show. Like, it's been, I think, 18 years since the last season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> I'm, you know, but it's sort that's of like. It's not factual. You know, I think the, I yeah, I think the idea uh, of. <laughs> it's. It's not factual. Um, but uh, I, I, I do think that there's a tremendous amount of creative space allowed. And, you know, and we're not Game of Thrones. So even they, you know, for their final two seasons, I think they're doing um, seven and six. Um, and so the idea of, like, why not just do a 13-episode season? Why do we have to wait a year between the seasons, et cetera? And the, and the short answer is, those guys get to do whatever the fuck they want to, you know? And, like, you know what, and I you, will be there. You know what the, the true lesson of The Leftovers was? The dragons were inside us all along. Wow. And on that note... They, they really were. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Mimi so Lair, Tom Parada, Damon Lindelof, all of you, thank you so much.